Our story begins at the Battle of Guinness, fought on the 30th of December 1885 in northern Sudan. You may recall from my previous video that it resulted in a victory for the Anglo-Egyptian army under Major General Francis Grenfell over the Mahdists. The defeated Mahdists fled south across the desert, leaving 400 of their comrades dead on the battlefield. Meanwhile, on the River Nile, a small boat desperately tried to follow their fleeing compatriots. It was filled with battle banners, weapons, and a woman with her baby boy. As the dervish survivors fled south, mounted British and Egyptian units harried them on their way. One of these was a mounted unit drawn from the Durham Light Infantry, led by Lieutenant de Lille. The 20-year-old officer from Guernsey had been awarded the Distinguished Service Order, the DSO, fighting the dervishes the previous month during the advance on Guinness. Two days after the battle, on the 1st of January 1886, they were moving up the Nile looking for Mardis stragglers when they spotted our boat slowly making its way up the river. The boat was swarming with dervish warriors and many more were on the banks pulling it on ropes, a bit like a horse might pull a barge in Europe. With night falling, the officer, Lieutenant de Lille, ordered his men to fire two, maybe three volleys at the boat. Pandemonium erupted on the boat, the men on the shore fleeing into the darkness of the desert, closely followed by those on board. Satisfied that the coast was clear, the lieutenant ordered his men forward to inspect the boat. In the growing darkness, they saw a movement on the water's edge. It was a tiny boy, possibly no more than two years of age. But despite his age, he stood there defiantly, pointing his fingers at the men of the Durham Light Infantry and making a firing sound. Amused, the officer approached him, whereupon the little boy raised his arms for a cuddle. And the officer obliged and then gave him to his NCO, Colour Sergeant Stewart, to look after. Boarding the boat, the British found a badly wounded dervish warrior. He'd been hit in the volley fire and, like the young boy, had been abandoned by the passengers as they fled. Through an interpreter, he told de Lille that the boy's name was Mustafa and his mother was the wife of a sheikh, a senior Mardis commander, killed in the battle. She was trying to reach the safety of her hometown, Berber, nearly 400 miles upriver. He had no idea where the woman was or whether she would return for the boy. The young British officer faced a dilemma. Should he leave the toddler with a dying man in the hope that his mother or some other kind soul would find him, rather than a Nile crocodile? Or alternatively, should he take the boy back to the British camp? Colour Sergeant Stewart and his men urged him not to leave the little boy behind. De Lille agreed. And so, on New Year's Day 1886, young Mustafa's life was to change forever and he was to find his own small place in British military history, as you're going to find out. Once back at the British camp, the lad was introduced to the sergeant's mess, and he immediately became a hit. These professional, experienced, battle-hardened Victorian soldiers took the young boy to their hearts. Sergeant James Burley and Sergeant Major James Francis took on the responsibility of looking after him. James Burley, in particular, formed a strong bond with the Sudanese toddler, whom he used to bath every day. Soon the sergeants had given Mustafa a new nickname. In true British military fashion, they called him Jimmy Dervish. Before the battalion headed back to Egypt, some local Sudanese women looked at Jimmy's teeth and judged him to be about two years old at best. For the next year, Jimmy became a popular member of the British garrison in Cairo. But in 1887, the 2nd Battalion Durham Light Infantry were posted to India. De Lille proposed that Jimmy be sent to an orphanage in the Egyptian capital. The sergeants were aghast. Jimmy might only be a wee lad and not from the northeast of England, but he was, as far as they were concerned, one of them. They pleaded with the officer to let the boy accompany them to India and had a whip round in their mess with every sergeant agreeing to contribute one rupee a month Jimmy's upkeep. Their commitment to their young charge won Lieutenant de Lille over. It wouldn't be the last time that the gritty sergeants from County Durham would take up Jimmy's cause, as you're going to discover in a little while. Before leaving for India, Jimmy was formally baptised. He took the names of his two carers, James, after Sergeant James Burley, Francis, after Sergeant Major Joseph Francis. But what would be his surname? He was the son of the regiment, 
and so naturally he was given part of the regiment's name. Thus it was that James Francis Durham set out with the rest of the battalion to India and his appointment with history. The 2nd Battalion Durham Light Infantry were to spend the next 15 years in India and as they travelled from post to post, James Durham attended school with the other children from the regiment. It was when the battalion was stationed in Mandalay, Burma in 1898 that James Durham, who was now about 14, contemplated his future. He had spent most of his life with the Durham Light Infantry and he considered them his family and they considered him part of their family too. Actually, not just the regimental family. Several sergeants literally invited him to be an honorary member of their actual families, such as the Robsons, who we're going to meet in a little while. But before that, James had a big decision to make. Actually, it was an easy decision. He wanted to join the army. However, there was one little hurdle. No black man had ever joined the Victorian British Army. Of course, there were plenty of black soldiers in colonial regiments, like the West Indian Regiment, for instance, and some black men had been brought into the British Army as drummers and musicians. However, none had ever joined the British Army on the same terms as white recruits. And Jimmy Durham was no exception. The doors of the military establishment slammed shut in his face. But the military establishment hadn't reckoned on the strength of feeling in the sergeant's mess. If Lieutenant, well now Captain, de Lille had thought they were persuasive, he hadn't seen anything yet. Whilst Kipling a few years earlier had written about the road to Mandalay, for the sergeants of the Durham Light Infantry, it was the road from Mandalay, all the way to the War Office in London. Despite securing the support of their officers, one by one the doors in Cumberland House, the home of the War Office, were closed to their pleas. Finally, in desperation, the sergeants pulled in every favour they could and appealed directly to the very top, the Commander-in-Chief herself. Now, many of you will know, but some of you won't, that members of all three branches of the British Armed Forces do not swear an oath of loyalty to the government or to the country. Their oath of allegiance is to the monarch. And so those white Victorian sergeants sent a passionate letter supporting James Durham's application to Queen Victoria. And somehow they won her over. The ageing Queen Empress, whose empire encompassed nearly a quarter of the world's population, approved James's application. In July 1899, James Francis Durham was formally enrolled as Boy Soldier number 6758 in the British Army. He was the first black man to ever join the regular British Army on the same terms as his white comrades. The good news for James was not only had he achieved his dream of joining the army, but he was still with the 2nd Battalion of the Durham Light Infantry, and he would stay with them for the rest of his military career. The 2nd Battalion left Mandalay in December 1900 for their final posting back in India, this time at Wellington in the far south of the country in what is now the state of Tamil Nadu. The barracks at Wellington are still used by the Indian Army today, although renamed the Srinagesh Barracks. It was here that James, affectionately known as Jimmy Durham, started to build a reputation in the regiment as a bit of an athlete, especially as a runner. Finally, in 1902, the 2nd Battalion Durham Light Infantry were recalled to Britain. They'd been away since 1884. And since then, they'd been to Egypt, Sudan, India, Burma, back to India again. Some of the men had spent 18 years outside Britain. It must have been an emotional homecoming for so many of those men. It must have been a bit of an eye-opener for James Durham. Having lived in Africa and India all his life, Bishop Auckland in December must have been a bit of a shock. Whilst living in England, he was taken under the wing of yet another NCO, Sergeant Robson. He became such a loved member of Robson's family that the sergeant's daughter, Stella, exchanged letters with James for the rest of their lives. In 1908, now married, Stella asked James Durham to stand as godfather to her first child. By then, James had experienced the joys of a posting with the battalion to Aldershot before in 1905 heading to Ireland. 
For the next four years, he was stationed at the Victoria Barracks in Cork, where he seemingly became a well-known and well-liked face in the local community. A devout teetotaler, James became the battalion's leading light in the Army Temperance Association. Common soldiers had long held a reputation for drunkenness and antisocial behaviour in local towns whilst off duty. Whilst not encouraged, officers had tended to turn a blind eye. But the moral indignation of the Victorians against vices like drunkenness had found its way into the army. The temperance movement appealed to many in authority, in particular General Lord Roberts of Kandahar. With his endorsement, the Army Temperance Association was established in 1893. The association used to issue medals to soldiers who reached various periods of sobriety, and in 1898 a report concluded that non-abstainers were nine times more likely than teetotalers to be court-martialed in the British Army. Which all sounds good, but asking Victorian, well now they're actually Edwardian soldiers, to go on the wagon while serving in Ireland of all places was a heck of a challenge. It was a challenge 21-year-old James Durham rose to. Taking the phrase, if you can't beat them, join them, he held his meetings directly across the road from the barracks, in a room above a pub. Incredibly, his efforts to move his comrades off the bottle were so successful that the regiment received a special award from the Army Temperance Society. Whilst in Ireland, Jimmy Durham also joined the regimental band, where he played clarinet. Military bands often act as ambassadors for their regiments, performing at outside events. And it was on one of those band trips back to the northeast of England in 1908 that he met Jane Green, no relative. Jane from Bishop Auckland was the daughter of a blacksmith. However, she was also sister to a quartermaster sergeant in the Durham Light Infantry, so maybe she had seen Jimmy before. Whatever, they fell in love and were married. Back in Ireland, the battalion moved 20 miles north from Cork to the barracks at Fermoy, and it was here in May 1910 that the Durham Light Infantry held a full parade to mark the ascension of the new king, George V. But it was also here on the 8th of August, that Private James Francis Durham died of pneumonia. He was 25, maybe 26. He was buried with full military honours in the graveyard in the town. Many of those sergeants from Sudan and India, now long retired, travelled from the northeast of England to be there. Such was their fondness and esteem for their lad. It is a sad ending to our story, but just to add to that sense of poignancy, just three weeks later, his wife, Jane, gave birth to their baby daughter. She was christened Francis. Exactly four years after Jimmy Durham's death, Great Britain entered the First World War in August 1914. The Second Battalion, Durham Light Infantry, were part of the British Expeditionary Force sent to the continent, heading to Mons. Had he survived his pneumonia, Jimmy would probably have been with them. By then, he would have had 16 years of military service. It's intriguing to wonder if he, rather than Walter Tull, could have become the first black officer in the regular British Army. Officialdom was dead set against that idea. But then, officialdom was dead set against him joining the army in the first place. And look what happened. Lieutenant de Lille, the officer who'd lifted up the little toddler on the banks of the Nile, went on to become a general in the First World War commanding on the Western Front, including at the Battle of the Somme, and at Gallipoli. Jimmy's daughter, Frances Durham, lived in Bishop Auckland until her death in 1998. While she married, she never had any children. History is not always about great battles or famous leaders. Ordinary people make history too. And James Francis Durham is a case in point. He participated in no battles, he won no medals for valour, but in his own small way, he did make history. In the last 100 years, many black soldiers have joined the British Army, including Colour Sergeant Johnson Bahari, who was awarded the Victoria Cross in 2004. But Jimmy was the first. The first black man to serve in the regular British Army on equal terms with his white comrades. Private James Francis Durham. Jimmy Dervish. Well, thanks for watching, and I hope you found that story both interesting and enjoyable. 
Loads more stories from British military history coming up this year, including the Indian Sepoy Mutiny, as well as more videos from Zulu and Boer Wars. But until then, thanks for your support, keep well, and I'll see you with another video very soon.